my country did not send me 5,000 miles to start the race. They sent me 5,000 miles to finish the race. This morning we're going to be talking about and we're going to be singing about perseverance. Because in the section of scripture that we're going to look at this morning, it could be boiled down to this. God did not save you to start the race of faith. He saved you to finish it. And as we are going about our journey of faith, as we are running that race, we get hurt and we get discouraged. We get injured. There's pain. Sometimes we wonder if it's worth it. Who's going to even notice if we finish? Who's going to care? It doesn't, the race isn't unfolding the way that we thought it would. And we could be tempted to give up, tempted to quit. But God hasn't called us just to start the race. When you got saved, when God saved you through Jesus Christ, that wasn't the end of your race. That was just the beginning. God hasn't called us just to start. God has called us to finish. That's perseverance. In Matthew chapter 10, as Jesus is continuing his instructions, talking to people, talking to his followers, telling them what it means to be a follower of him and how to live their lives, one of the things he starts to address with them is perseverance. And we have that in chapter, in Matthew chapter 10, verses 26 and following. We'll be talking about this in a few minutes, but let's just look at the verses. It says, therefore, do not fear. Do not fear them. He was just talking about people who are going to hate you because you're a Christian. He's talking about people who are going to give you a hard time. And he says, don't be afraid of them. There is nothing covered that won't be revealed, and there is nothing hidden that will not be known. Whatever I tell you in the dark, Jesus says, speak in the light. And whatever you hear in the ear, preach on the housetops. Do not fear those who can kill the body but can't kill the soul. But rather, fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And yet not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will. The very hairs on your head are numbered. God is so intimately acquainted with every detail of your life down to the very numbers of the hairs on your head. God knows them. So don't be afraid. You're of more value than many sparrows. Therefore, so here's the conclusion. Whoever confesses me before men, I will also confess that person before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. Jesus is teaching them that in the course of running their race of faith, they are going to face opposition. They are going to face things that are going to cause them to want to quit, to want to give up. And Jesus calls them to perseverance, to keep running the race. What does Christian victory look like to you? When you think about living a victorious Christian life, what does that look like? Does it look like getting, standing in front of some huge crowds and thousands of people responding when, to your message so that they get saved? Does it look like going into some faraway country and witnessing to people who have never heard the gospel? We are each called to our own individual style of race, but the one thing that Jesus wants, the one thing that Jesus requires of all of us is to finish the race. The temptation is when we are running our Christian life, but then we run across someone, we run into someone, we're confronted by someone who wants to give us a hard time about it, that we back off and maybe, you know, deny that we're Christians. Maybe when life gets really hard, we decide, yeah, I'm not sure Christianity's worth it. Jesus knows that's the temptation that when we run into the difficult things of life, we're going to be tempted to quit. Victory doesn't mean being unscathed. Sometimes your uniform gets dirty. Sometimes you get hurt. Victory is perseverance. And that means every one of us can have the victory of Jesus Christ because every one of us can run to the finish. Our time doesn't matter. 
How beat up we might be doesn't matter. Jesus calls us to persevere. That's what great athletes do. That's what John Stephen did. That's what Jesus calls us to do. The passage that we're looking at this morning speaks of not being afraid, of looking in the face of those who would oppose you, of those who would make your life hard because of your faith and not being afraid, of persevering even in the face of opposition, of difficulty. Jesus' instructions to his disciples are about what to do when that happens. And more importantly, it's about why. What is the rationale behind not being afraid? What allows us to persevere as believers? Because Jesus knows, and we know all too well, that our first inclination when we are confronted by people who are opposing us, or situations that are hard, or we, when, when we start limping through the race of our faith, Jesus knows our first inclination is to shrink back, to doubt our faith, to question ourselves, to question our Savior. That's a natural, that's a human response. But in this passage in Matthew chapter 10, Jesus gives us four specific reasons why we can persevere, why we don't need to be afraid. When, when we see these things, the opposition, the difficulties of life, we can persevere. Jesus gives us four specific reasons why. And we're going to look at those this morning in the passage that we had. And the first one is simply found in the first two verses. In verse 26 and 27, Jesus said, Don't fear them. Why? Because there is nothing covered that will not be revealed. And there is nothing hidden that will not be known. When at whatever I, Jesus says to his followers, whatever I tell you in the dark, whatever I say to you secretly, just between you and me, I want you to say that in the middle of the day. And what I whisper, the secret that I whisper in your ear, the thing that you and I and a few other people know, that's the thing I want you to shout out from the rooftops. What is Jesus' point? Why can you be that bold? Because you will be vindicated. With 15 games left in the 2011 baseball season, the St. Louis Cardinals, who as Christians from Chicago we hate, were five games out of the playoffs with 15 games left to go. They were out of it. A fan of St. Louis, who happened to be in Las Vegas, decided it would be a good idea to put $250 down on the St. Louis Cardinals at 99-1 to 1 to make it to the World Series. And then he bet another $250 for that the St. Louis Cardinals would win the World Series. And that they gave him the odds of 500-1. to 1. 15 games, two weeks left in the season. The Cardinals weren't even qualified for the playoffs. They weren't even close to be qualified for the playoffs. But he went in, his friends laughed at him as he went in and put that $500 total down on the St. Louis Cardinals to win the World Series. St. Louis Cardinals made the playoffs, made it to the World Series, won the World Series, and this guy's ticket, which he bought for $500, he cashed in for $375,000. The point is obvious. You should gamble more. <laughs> you should be betting. This was speculation. This was wishful thinking. What would you do if you knew you were going to win the bet? What if, there, what if you knew the result of the game? This week, the Blackhawks opened up their preseason. And uh, the game was on tape delay. The game started at 7 o'clock, but the game wasn't, until, uh, wasn't on TV until 9 o'clock. And that's what they were doing for a lot of preseason games this, this last week. I was sitting in the house with actually Jeremiah was over. We were watching a football game, and we were also watching the hockey game. And Kalen was in the other room, and the Washington Capitals Flyers game was on. And it's not important, but what was important is that the game was on tape delay. And what's important is that I saw the ticker at the bottom, and I knew that Philadelphia Flyers won that game. But there was a point in the middle of the game when the Washington Capitals were winning. 
So I, I knew the result because it was tape delay. But Kaylin, who was in the other room doing her homework or something, wasn't paying attention, she didn't know. And so when the Capitals were winning, I bet her $100 that the Flyers would win that game. Now, she knew something was up, and so she wouldn't take the bait. But how confident was I in that bet? I knew that I would be vindicated. I knew I would be vindicated. And that is Jesus' point. When Jesus says, whatever I whisper in your ear, shout from the rooftops. Whatever I tell you in secret, say it publicly. What is Jesus' point? Jesus' point is that you will be, we will be vindicated. We will be proved right. Just like that guy who walked in with the ticket, when he bought that ticket, people thought he was foolish. Well, he was the one having the last laugh. Right now, in this world, as we walk around with our faith, talking about Jesus Christ, not being ashamed, there are a lot of people who will want to make us foolish, feel foolish. We may feel foolish ourselves when we hear time after time, in place after place, that God and Jesus and all those are fairy tales. But Jesus says we don't have to be ashamed. Jesus says we can persevere. Why? Because we will be vindicated. When the results finally come in for everyone to see, we will win. So Jesus says, bet big. Jesus says, all the stuff I'm telling you now that doesn't have widespread acceptance yet, it's going to come to fruition. It's going to happen. Right now, at this moment, it seems unlikely, yet it's going to come true. Jesus says we can be proud about what we have because we are going to win. Because the race has already been won, the game has already been played, Jesus has won. We are going to clean up on a bet on a game that has already been played. We will be vindicated. And if you really believe that, you wouldn't have any fear in putting down your money. If you really believe that Jesus has won the victory for us. You wouldn't be afraid to confront a neighbor or to be confronted by a coworker, To be willing to stand up in school and share your faith. To share it with your family. If you really knew, Jesus says you can believe it. You will be vindicated. That's the first reason that we can be bold in the face of opposition. God calls us to it. Do you trust that voice that is whispering in your ear that says, bet big on Jesus? Are you willing to put your life on the line for that bet? Jesus tells his followers, announce your affiliation with me now, announce it boldly. Announce it loudly. I don't care how many people are giving you a hard time about it. Tell your friends. Because the stuff that isn't obvious now is going to become obvious later. And those of us who have been in the minority, it will eventually become evident to all that we were right to put our faith in Jesus Christ. God is whispering in our ear, telling us this game is over. Bet on the winning side. We will be vindicated. And so you, in your life, as you are running the race of your faith, can be bold. You don't have to shrink back in the face of people who oppose you or contradict you or who want to belittle you or rid and ridicule you because of your faith. Why? Because you will be vindicated. At the moment, in this moment in time, it might not look like it, like it, but Jesus wants you to know he knows the ending of this game. This game has been played. You will be vindicated. That's the first thing. Here's the second thing, and it's found in verse 28 and following in chapter 10. In, in verse 28, Jesus says, Don't fear those who can kill the body, but can't kill the soul. But rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. You know, that video show I showed at the beginning of John Stephen Aquani when he was running in that marathon. 
one of the things that you learn, and by the way, when I ask, who are the, when I ask you who are your favorite athletes, um, thank you for both of you who voted for me. Um, Kaelin and Mom, thank you. That was very nice. I got half as many votes as Walter Payton did, so that's pretty cool. I'm looking around to see which one of the Packers fans voted for Reggie White. Uh, no, yeah. Oh, see, they're pointing behind you. They're all... You know, when John Stephen Aquari was running in that race, and he was hurting and he was in pain, he knew what great athletes know. It's only going to hurt for so long. Pain is temporary, but the pride of persevering lasts forever. He knew this. Great athletes know that. Great athletes know their wounds will heal. Persevering through pain means it will hurt for a while. But quitting is something that haunts them forever. And it's only through working through the pain that triumphs like his are possible. It'll only hurt for a while. There's only so much it can hurt. It would be great if there was no pain, if there were no trials, if there was no difficulty in the Christian life. But Jesus is very realistic when he's talking to his disciples and he tells them that following me is going to be hard. It's going to be uncomfortable. There's going to be pain. And Jesus also knows that one of the reasons that we shy away from sharing our faith with people or one of the things that causes us to shrink back when we find our faith under attack is that we're afraid of the pain and we're trying to avoid the pain. The pain of being ridiculed. The pain of people not wanting to hang around with us. But in doing that, we're putting the power of these people ahead of the power of God. These are people who have a limited power, Jesus says. They can at worst, the worst they can do to you is hurt your body. The worst they could do to you is take your life. And you are acting like they're the most important people. When instead, you should be more concerned about my perspective. You should be more concerned about the perspective of a God who's in charge of both body and soul. What they do to your body is short term, is temporary. What they do to you if they make fun of you or they tease you or something more serious, some kind of persecution that's more serious, is temporary. Don't fear them. You're giving them too much influence. You're giving them too much power. There's only so much they can do to you. In your life, who are you most afraid of? Who would you be most afraid of to show the fact that you're a Christian, that you're a believer? Do you believe that Jesus Christ isn't a fairy tale? It's not a Sunday school story, but he was a real historical person and he was God in the flesh who came to earth and died on the cross so we could be saved from our sins. Who would you most be terrified to share that story with? Who as you're walking around through your day-to-day Christian life and you're trying to figure out a way to get your Christian values and moralities into your life, who would you most be embarrassed about? Jesus says, don't worry so much about them. After all, there's only so much they can do to you. What can they do? Maybe they can fire you. Maybe they can gossip about you. Maybe they can in some real way Make your life harder. Maybe they can, but that's all that they can do. But they can't touch your soul. They can't touch your eternal destiny. So don't despair about what they do. They can't touch your soul. So you don't have to be afraid. There's only so much they can do. Death and bodily harm seem pretty rare to us as Americans living in this century. It does happen, though. There are people in the world who, for whom this is a reality. According to the Christian Broadcasting Network, last year, 160,000 believers around the world were killed because they were Christians. So we look at this passage of Scripture, and we have to kind of break it down and change the persecution to someone making fun of us. Or maybe someone at work giving us a hard time or denying us promotion. This is real. This is life and death for lots of people around the world. Even in the 20th century, even in our enlightened times today. But you know what these people know and believe is that eternity is real. Is that God is in charge of the soul. And no matter what opponents can do, 
they can't touch us. There's only so much they can do. They can't touch our soul. They can't touch our heart. Why does that matter to you? As you're walking through your Christian life, there's only so much they can do. So don't be afraid. The pain that they can inflict is temporary. Eternity, the God who has saved your soul, lasts forever. Those are the first two things Jesus wants to call our attention to. The first two reasons that we cannot be ashamed. We cannot be afraid. We can persevere when it gets tough. Verse 29 through 31 gives us the next reasons. In verse 29 through 31, Jesus says, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Penny. Penny. What is he trying to say? And not one of them falls to the ground without your father knowing about it. Why is he talking about sparrows and pennies? He goes on to say, even the very hairs of your head are numbered. For some of you, it's easier for God to do that than for others. But this is an intimate knowledge. God knows what's going on in the world down to the minutia of when a sparrow falls out of a tree. God knows what is going on in your life down to the minutia as he knows how many hairs are on the top of your head. He knows the most intimate details of your life. Why does that matter? Well, the result of God knowing that is that you shouldn't be afraid. Therefore, do not be afraid. Why? Because we're more valuable than many sparrows. God is paying that close of attention. Nothing happens to a sparrow without his knowledge. And we're more valuable than a sparrow. God is paying attention. Why do you need to not be afraid? Because God has your back. God is paying attention to what is going on. If God is paying attention to beings that are of less value than you have to him, then you can be assured that God is paying, atta- uh, uh, paying attention in your situation. The injustice and the hardships that you're going through now don't escape his attention, and they're going to be factored in eventually and eternally. You know, John Stephen Aquari in that race, he didn't finish to be noticed. He finished because that's what his country sent him to do. But in doing that, in persevering, he was noticed. A lot of the spectators had left. All of the competitors have left. But some people were there. And some people witnessed that act of bravery. Someone on camera caught it. And now that act of perseverance lives on. And 30, 40, 50 years later, people are still talking about it. It's still inspiring. God is paying attention. You might think that you're doing some action. You're displaying some boldness or perseverance. You might be willing to do it if you knew God was paying attention, but really you're not sure he is. We all, some of us were raised... That the idea of God is watching you was a threat. Did your parents ever do that to you? Did your Sunday school teacher ever do that to you? God is watching you. Like God really cares if you're chewing gum. You know? God's watching you. God watching you isn't a threat. God watching you as a believer should be the greatest comfort that there is. God is paying attention to you. Have you been there? Have you had moments like this either when you were the kid or as a parent? Right? The kid's at the edge of the pool. The kid wants to jump in, but the kid is afraid. But dad or mom is in the pool. Now, if dad is looking around and talking to someone else, and, you know, the kid's not going to, he's not going to jump. But if you know dad is paying attention or mom is paying attention, the kid's willing to jump. A little afraid? Yeah. But dad is there. Mom is there. It's going to be okay. What, tra- what changes that situation? The fact that someone who loves them is paying attention. God is paying attention. So when you find your faith causing, causing a hard time in your life, when someone is giving you a hard time, when you're afraid that you're not, it's, is it going to be worth it to stand up for my faith here, to stand up for my Christian principles? It's going to be scary to share my faith with someone. Is it going to be worth it? I want you to know, Jesus wants you to know that God is paying attention. So don't be afraid. Jump. Jump. God has you. God notices. God is watching you is not a threat. 
It's the greatest comfort a believer can have. Here's the final point. And the final point is really just it. It's the final point. Perseverance is what we were called for. This is the mark of real faith. God did not cross time and space through the person of Jesus Christ and save us just for us to start the race. God saved us so that we would finish the race. So that we would endure the obstacles of whatever jumps up in our way in Christian life and makes it painful. God called us to persevere through that. So that others seeing us would be inspired. So that our personal faith would be deepened. And if in the face of this promised hardship, this promised opposition, if in the face of that we maintain our faith, it is faith. It really is faith. And God is going to reward that. But in the face of faith of opposition, if people don't hold on to their attachment of Christ, then there's no Christ that God can acknowledge in their life. There's no attachment to Christ when that final day of vindication comes. Persecution gives us the opportunity to display our faith in a powerful way. If you look back over human history, the recipe for the spread of Christianity is really very simple. And it's the same recipe that works at work or at school, in your neighborhood, Here's the recipe. Persecution plus Christians who are willing to endure it equals the growth of Christianity. Where Christianity is persecuted, where Christians, it, where it is a bold thing to stand up for your faith, and add to that where there are people who want to persecute you for your faith, if you have those two elements, you have the conditions for Christianity to spread like wildfire. As a very famous saying goes, Christianity is the anvil that has worn out a thousand hammers. People throughout the course of human history have been hammering on Christianity, trying to make it disappear, trying to make it go away. But because there have been people who have been willing to persevere in the face of opposition, Christianity spreads like wildfire. Do you want Christianity, do you want your faith to spread around the people in your circle, the people whom God has called you to be an example to and to minister to. You need two things. You need someone who's willing to persecute you. They're doing their part. All that's left is you doing yours. Doesn't mean you have all the answers. Doesn't mean you never screw up. It doesn't mean you're not injured. It just means no matter what, you hold on to your faith in Jesus Christ. Even through your flaws, even through your failings, Don't be intimidated, Jesus says. Don't be afraid to go public now. Don't be bullied into silence by the threats of culture or of friends or of family members who in the grand scheme of things really can do very little to you. You have a tip from a reliable source and it might not look like it now, but this long shot called Christian faith, will come in. And if you're willing to bet, if you're willing to stand firm, if you're willing to shout from the rooftops today about what you know in private, you will be vindicated. So that's what I want to ask you this morning. Are you willing to persevere? I know you want to. I know as you sit here and you hear this, You want to persevere. You want to be one of those who stands up boldly. And on the day when God makes everything right, God points to you and says, yep, he was right. She was right. We all want that. We have to choose. The fear is there, but we have to choose to act rightly even in the face of that fear. We have to act to persevere. That's the kind of faith that God has called us to, not to start the race, but to finish the race. God has called us to finish. God has called us to fight. We need to fight.